of a special textual tradition. Let's come to these briefly attributed to the hand of Augustine alone and Ambrose were both regarded as relics of the saints and characters of the authorship of celebrated and venerated patristic works. Important as the aforementioned roles of the autograph manuscript are, and have been from medieval times onward, another and most important role of the autograph is to give insight into the authorial process. Such a, uh, since at least the 19th century, students of literary history have searched for and carefully preserved manuscripts that, rec that record by erasure, marginal, and interlineal annotations of strong wa, arrows, and light marks, the creative process by which a first draft involves into a memorable and fully compacted masterpiece. It is important when we turn to antiquity, the Middle Ages, and the early Renaissance to realize that autographs of this character that provide such insight into the creative process are either entirely absent or scarcely present. The autograph attributed falsely to Virgil is a telegraphic manuscript, deeply telegraphic on the codices previously attributed to the late antique church fathers like Augustine. The illuminations and paintings of the Middle Ages and Renaissance that Joseph Israel, Augustine, and both writing their compositions are in fact anachronistic. The Greeks and Romans of here I took some of the previous speakers generally composed the dictation of the secretary, who took down their words in syllabic shorthand, either on Latin tablets or on parchment notebooks. The antecedents of the medieval codex that before the third century were used primarily for, for provisional notes and, for, and not for a compacted text, for which the appropriate medium would have been to laterally extend and scroll. Rare indeed were figures like Ambrose, who are known and wrote about and uh, who acknowledged through writing their own letters and tracts. As I have explained elsewhere, the ancient culture of Bell Letter was largely an oral one, in which the process of composition, like that of reading, was habitually vocal. The contraction of the classical world of letters with its division of labor between authors, secretaries, and professional readers within the confines of monastic communities, such as Cassiodorus's retreat at Bavarian, undoubtedly brought authors into more intimate contact with the books that contained their text, which by this day were almost exclusively in codex form. Cassiodorus was concerned with text formats that would simplify reading, such as the lines of sense, for collat and commata, the styles by Jerome, they simple confrayers, punctuation. Perhaps even the insistent variation characteristic of certain late antique Christian codices written in scriptura or continuous writing, but we must remember all that right at the time of the ancients in, in, the, in the Roman Empire and, and for the whole period of Greek antiquity, there were no spaces between words and, and no, virtually no punctuation. Elsewhere, I set forth the general thesis that the full word separation that came to characterize all the obscure Latin script in the late 8th century permitted the evolution of silent reading. Logically, this new script would then enable the silent and entirely visual decoding of text with a fostered silent autograph composition. However, the use of wax tablets and a parchment book was similar to those employed in late antiquity has left us correct of any tangible evidence of authorial autograph activity in the British Isles, where at any rate, most surviving Latin books were copies of the Gospels. Johannes Scottish, an Irishman at the court of Charles the Bald in the 9th century, however, left words separated corrections as addition to the formal scribal transcriptions of his works, which had been copied from prior drafts by continental hands in unseparated script. Word separation, which enhanced the, the manipulation of written text, was a prerequisite for the modern draft autograph. Authorial codices, that is, text written in formal book script with occasional corrections, reasonably attributable to the author, became characteristic of word separated literary circles from the time of the Honest Scottish to the end of the 10th and into the early 11th century. There are a number of examples of which the most famous is Reicher's uh, uh, Chronicle of the Franks, which is just only one codex in Bamberg, which has uh, some revisions in, in it. Uh, others include uh, the uh, Jackson of the Bishops of Cambrai, which is associated in the uh, 11th century with Gerard of Cambrai, which has authorial, uh, thought to be authorial marks in it. Provision. Another with far fewer marks is the, uh, the reputed authorial codex containing the poem of which Albert Beck. Right. The early 10th century explicitly refers to the notebooks that used for composing preliminary versions of his work. Notebooks along with wax tablets that surely continue to serve, serve an important draft function for the authorial creative process. 10th and 11th century examples of such artifacts, however, scarcely survive. Indeed, we only have a single example of a codex which might be deemed a notebook and only a very few wax tablets, none of which bear witness to autograph composition. However, in literary text, an increasing practice of composing in written form has left its traces. Guibert de Nogent, at the end of his life, lamented that due to incipient blindness, could no longer write his text, but was obliged to dictate to a secretary. The case of Guibert is particularly revealing, for although quite clearly somewhat of an eccentric, he left the page about free in written form to write erotic poems that record disturbing dream, the dreams and fantasies, which, it is fair to speculate, he might have been more hesitant to divulge orally to a secretary. Even earlier, Othman de saint amand active in an early South German center of word separation, expressed his own erotic fantasies within the new medium. Avalar's history of, the, of his calamities is a 12th century example of this genre. However, the artifacts that might have documented the documentation of the, the drafting of such compositions of these works of a highly personal character have all vanished. 
It's a medium of words that raises the threat of the propensity of authors on occasion to write their own compositions and, more frequently, to correct and modify a composition transcribed by secretaries. The writing materials of the pre scholastic period and later of the scholastic age were still not conducive to the use of a pen as a primary instrument for composition. Parchment was expensive, which has been made today, and relative both to ancient papyrus and modern paper, a difficult support on which to write. Why is tablets constituted more user friendly or alternative for short sections of text? Text, but because of their limited surface, they were clearly incapable of receiving a full draft of an entire opus. It is thus within the demi-oral milieu of scholastic composition characteristic of universities in the Central Middle Ages that the, en that the en enigmatic vocabulary for the authorial composition of the uh, medieval composition must be assessed. Here, the term dictari retained its ancient meaning of composing orally a text, although on occasion the verb might also be used to refer to text composed entirely in written form. The verb dictari is in, in the sense of reading aloud a fully composed text as a means of rapidly producing copies occurred really only after the year 1400. Uh, the Tari wasn't even a normal word for a uh, literary composition, and could refer to either read, uh, written composition or oral composition. At the same time, the term scrivera was replete with comparable ambiguity. St. Bonaventure, in a famous passage of his preface to his commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard, enunciated four meanings of scrivera uh, that might be, or simplicity, be summarized as three separate activities. For Bonaventure, scrivera to write might refer to the activity of copying, that is, of book production, the activity of compiling, that is, of copying and extracting and combining types of works of recognized authors, and implicitly of reordering these works, and with subdivisions to enhance their clarity, and last was the activity of authoring, that is, the expression of the writer's own opinions in what we would term original written composition. Before the late 14th century, the oral dimension of composition was most important those varieties of texts that were most distinctly removed from the process of compilatio. The epistle and the sermon were two genres which included, which, which were usually short works that to a large degree were spontaneously generated viva voce. In contrast, the written dimensions of authorship is most in evidence in the scholastic genres that included compilations of canon law, commentaries on the sentences of Peter Lombard, commentaries on scripture, commentaries on Aristotle, and in their derivatives, the summons of theological thought. Here, the process of ordinatio and compilatio were most in evidence, and as Bonaventure's remarks suggest, in such works, the task of author and a scribe insisted on each other. In the 14th and 15th centuries, the last race increasingly dissected, segmented, and recombined chunks of prose drawn from, their, from both the ancient fathers and 13th century masters. We moderns tend to think of that composing a late scholastic work such as John Rousseau's commentary on Aristotle's ethics and the copying of a book of hours such as Newberry Library Manuscript 56, The Hours of Marguerite of Plot, were by definition totally different centuries. And yet, viewed in a larger perspective, the process as far as Bonaventure's remarks to imply profoundly related. For sure, the read author acted as scribe when he derived plots of sentences from the anterior commentaries of Albert Magnus, Thomas Aquinas, and Johannes Berger. His original contribution was chiefly in the nuances of his responses to pre-established questions. That which was unique was a very small percentage of the entire prose content of the tone. Similarly, the scribe of each book of hours was an author in the sense that he chose a sequence of devotional prayers that might compose a large portion of his volume. As scribe compiler, he had the liberty to add nuances by rephrasing a rubric, indicating the modes and uses of prayer. These brief textual elements that constitute a minuscule percentage of the prose content of a book of hours to the modern scholar, a scholar may be among its most original and significant aspects. In the milieu of the Cartesian content of the 15th century, the scholastic mode of written composition through a compilation reached its zenith in a world of solitary silence. In the massive opera of Dennis the Carthusian that fills over 40 printed volumes, virtually the entire content is a syncretic ordinatio of prose elements drawn from the father's earlier scholastic and liturgy. Three highly significant changes are responsible for the evolution of the autograph manuscript into a document conducive of preserving a record of authorial creativity, the very document that collectors so want to achieve and possess. The first of these was the introduction of paper, beginning in the late 14th century, to paper for uh, books as opposed to paper for documents. Paper preempted the use of wax tablets and provided a medium for authorial composition potentially suitable for preservation. 15th century paper codices, particularly those of the Carthusian order, offer us far more, uh, far more tangible examples of the medieval compilatio that survived for the central Middle Ages in the Carthusian era. The first five here. We didn't like one. How do we get this? Oh, there we are. This is a manuscript of the Newberry Library. It's an autograph compilation of Johannes Hagen, a, a mid 15th century Carthusian uh, friar who, who wrote, uh, as was the medieval custom, ex ex as an extract from the church fathers and composed his own works. And, this is, and all of this material was bound up together and undoubtedly saved because he was an important personage in the context of Airport. And you can see on the right, he just writes onto this slip of paper, which you can see on the next slide. It's really a, a used piece of document in this context. Uh, it, it, it just shows how paper became available. And slips of paper were used for this purpose to, uh, to uh, for draft writing material, you know, draft of compilations, and that draft of the creative sense that uh, some of us have been talking about today. Concomitantly with this introduction of paper, a revolution binding that enabled codices to be shelved vertically accidentally provided in the leaves and taste downs a, a locus for paper fragments of draft positions to be preserved. 
this is uh, this is uh, another preposition, and it's with which the paint takes down to have uh, what we believe to be uh, a, uh, autographed notes of uh, uh, another Carthusian friar, Heinrich Reicher, who was in fact the author of the textual uh, of, the, of the bulk of this manuscript. Uh, in the earlier Middle Ages, it may be, we're not at all sure that taste down some pilots, but certainly, we were, they certainly became much more common in the 15th century. So we had two things happening. One, we had paper allowing, uh, 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 giving more material evidence, and two, we have a change in binding, and a mammoth effort of rebinding old libraries that meant that many fragments and things that, that would not have been kept retained prior to that, to 1400, were retained just only by accident. An additional technical thing linked to the draft of the Dauphir graph was the development of cursive writing. The friendlier support of paper doubtlessly encouraged writing in which the doctors necessitated minimal witness of the quill from the page. In contrast to antiquity, when Ambrose regarded writing scriptura continua as a mode of composition slower than meditation, cursive word separated writing on paper provided a rapid deed, highly simple for capturing the creative process in situ. The use of cursive writing for the vernacular, which in the course of the 15th century constituted an ever increasing portion of the handwritten literary pages produced, encouraged the disjunction between written composition and activity of compilatio linked to quarrying the Latin corpus of scholastic text. And thereby encouraged a more spontaneous expression of thought in written form. In Latin, the disjunction was encouraged even more by, by 15th century humanism, with its emphasis on rhetorical eloquence and moral philosophy, as opposed to logic, theology, and law. Humanists were drawn to the cursive script as a fit medium for the expression of the new ideal of discursive written rhetoric. Indeed, the first truly substantial autograph manuscripts revealing the spark of creativity were produced by humanists in Italy in the mid-15th century. A startling example is the extensive draft autograph of George of Trentazon, preserved in Newbury Library in a Newbury Library manuscript. And here we have it, and this one can You have the cursive writing, or ordinary writing. This is a whole choir added onto a book, which he himself copied out as a formal book spread. And here, in these smudged portions, you really have writing over erasure. Okay, let me get a better idea of this. Here is the beginning of these autographs. This was also his writing as a, as a scribe, his own scribe, writing as a, but this is the second recension which material was added in the margins and when space went into the margins, the whole additional session of text was added in a separate wire. Such draft autographs were rarely preserved. This one preserved only because it was completing an already existent book. And no comparable informal drafts have yet been discovered for Leonardo Rumi or Marcelio Ficino. But preserved or not, and additional examples may yet be found in 15th century binding, they, they came to exist as paper and cursive writing combined to form a theater suitable for the creative process to be recorded. Printing provided the final ingredient for the triumph of autograph composition. In the first half of the 15th century, all scholars, including professional humanists, were scribes as well as authors. The distinction between these two functions being arbitrary. Were tra were they were trained in a hierarchy of scripts. Except for such exceptional cases of the Trevisan Codex, uh, the author uh, the, the was calligraphically in an expert manner, recopied his own text and destroyed his draft. Um, Heinrich Reicher, who uh, the treatise on divine wisdom, bears the inscription that this was a copy that the author had scripted at conscription. That is, he composed in written form and then he engrossed as in a prepared, fair copy. Even the illumination of the versus a storefront on a street, etc., we almost take them like bread to fit into the confines of different uh, situations. And we then looked at developing those surfaces geometrically and preparing them for a computer tool so that we could build them using the same technology anywhere. And what I found, and I know that a couple of these companies right by here using them. Um, the automobile prototypers in California, there are four different firms that make automobile prototypes, which are body formed and interior blocks of foam, which roll around for car shows. They don't actually drive, but they have the skin and the structure and the interior of a car. And the per square foot cost of building one of those for Audi last month was $400 a square foot. So the square foot cost of building one of a kind working cars is basically the same square foot cost of, of a kind of high-end residential uh, house or a high-end interior. So we use these automobile prototypers to make all the components. And in Sweden, we called up the prototypers that work for Volvo and uh, Saab and just sent them files over the internet and they built the interior of our showroom using these, uh, these cutting tools. So one of the things that we found, and this is a piece of that interior, is that rather than make a building that looked like a computer rendering, we wanted to use the tool and its artifacting to produce a new kind of materiality. So these ridges that look like kind of corduroy are the artifact of the, of the bit, which is used to cut the wood. And we found that we needed to program the paths for this tool so that we could always get our, our patterning to align. And we started to think about the, the artifact of the tool is actually a design technique and started to basically sketch what the articulation of these surfaces would be based on the control of this bit. So these bumps that you see that we put on it, 
to those paths, you know, in the finished interior, you know, we're very much part of the aesthetic and the materiality of the surface. So instead of trying to make a slick, uh, reflective computer image in build form, we're really trying to use the tools to generate new kinds of articulation and even a kind of uh, ornament. And you'll see the last thing I'll show you is a kind of much more developed version of that. Um, this is a, you know, the kind of the newest obsession, which is a figure called a web, and it's all industrial designers, this is the bane of their existence. The problem is when you use these spline curves, whenever you have a curve which has convexity or concavity, when you offset the curve to give it material thickness, the curve intersects itself. So you can see this fold, when offset with this much material thickness, first develops a single intersection like this and this, eventually pulls through itself two times and generates these geometric problems, basically, of the surface which intersects itself. And all of our software has tools which put these things away and they disappear, but it always screws up the rigor of our services. So a year ago, I started turning it off, turning off this automatic procedure, and we started using these captured spaces as an architectural scale space, spatial device. So one of the first things we did is we're doing a large scale I hate to say art objects, but art objects for, for a, a tax protester at the gallery in New York, where we're doing additions of lighting fixtures, additions of floor elements, additions of wall dividers, um, where we'll build 10 variations of a very similar piece. And these are diagrams for um, a skylight, the first one we're building right now. And we went with single, double, and triple folds and started to combine these things into different patterns. You can see here, you know, three of those folds merging with one along this axis, three merging with two in that axis. We came up with a kind of catalog, all of the geometrical possibilities we could think of, of those folded components, and then started to select and redesign uh, the ones that were giving us the, the most promising architectural features. So these are the ten that we're building for the skylight systems. And each of the dark components are where these elements fold through themselves. And this is a photograph of a scale model. These will be about 10 feet by 11 feet square. And this is a, a model of the formwork that will cast the plastic on. So you can see the rippling and reaching becomes part of the surface effect. And it has a really strong optical quality on the, on the clear material when we cast it. And here we have to break these geometries into components. So we'll cast first one large piece, and then we'll cast these pieces individually out of two components. So we'll build these out of sheets. And the way we subdivide them is really based on the manufacturing technology. This same technique we used for a proposal for a new museum in Chelsea that I did with David Childs and Roger Duffy at Skin Whirling and Barrel. We decided to team up. I'd never done a vertical project, and they're the masters of towers. And we thought it was a good opportunity to apply some of these surface modeling technologies to the design of a curtain wall. So for this project, which is a, this is about 30 stories high, and it's right on the Hudson River, we decided to model the building as a surface, which hold it around, and we decided to gives the building its identity by folding the curtain wall skin out onto the street. So this is a primitive version of what we started with with these spline curves. And you'll see progressively this is boxed as a detail of this form right here. We took the geometry of the surface and began to dent it, and then loop it and fold it through itself so that the exhibition spaces, you see these webs forming, so that the exhibition spaces take the vertical volumes of the curtain wall and fold them out and literally turn the surface of the building inside out so that what was the inside surface of the museum gets folded around outside to make these volumes and these become occupiable spaces for special installations where you get total um, surface presentation. So they're like immersive rooms adjacent to more than all gallery spaces. And this is on 21st Street. And the entry of these folds here, there's one piece where we take these streets and fold it into the building. So I think you'll see here, this is a structural diagram of how we build it with these structural mullions that hang on the skin. You can see here we fold the street into the building to make a large auditorium and event space. So the, the kind of geometric problem and the ability to sketch it with the computer became the generative tool uh, for, for rethinking the building facade. And these are images of it. The top ten stories of this are non-occupiable, but we found out this museum wants to use the top four floors of the museum to lease office space to kind of internet startups. And it's worth about thirty two dollars a square foot right now, probably less every day. But uh, we found out the surface of the building is worth twenty three dollars a square foot as an advertising service. And that they can actually build this zone, which is pretty unusable by the time you put a core in it, and project images on it, almost like the kinds of curtain walls that are in Times Square. And the museums that start to have a presence on the city skyline, 
uh, using the upper portion of the building for digital display and presentation. So that there's this kind of exhibition space on the surface, and then there are these folded surfaces which make for exhibition spaces on the street. These are views of the interior looking out into these folded volumes on the facade. Okay, finally, uh, the last thing I wanted to show you is uh, uh, the third collaboration I've done with a painter named Fabian Marcaccio. And Fabian and I have been trying to find a way to work architecturally and with painting where both of us remain experts in our own fields, but where we start to collaborate in terms of the form and surface of, of the installation. So this is a detail of one of the, the, the painting that we started this particular collaboration with. And we want